Hello, this is video number four for module five. And in this video, I will be covering extensions of Mendelian genetics having to do with inheritance of traits encoded by organeller genes, genes carried in organelles. Um, and the two main examples are mitochondrial and chloroplast genes. So what I'd like to do in this video is do the first part of this outline. And in the next video, uh, I will cover the second part. First part is kind of an overview of mitochondria and, and uh, chloroplasts, and also examples of inheritance through, through chloroplasts. And the second half in the next video will be inheritance through mitochondria and how that is in, uh, involved in human diseases. All right, so first thing, overview of mitochondria. And this is just basic structure and uh, basic function. And then we're going to tie that in with how mutations are going to impact my mitochondrial function and also how they'll have a, a phenotype in the whole organism. So basic structure of a mitochondrion shown here. It's got a double membrane. Uh, the, uh, the inner membrane is highly folded and protrudes into the interior of the mitochondrion. And if you look at uh, one of these membranes, they're called the cristae. Uh, there are embedded in the membrane a lot of transmembrane proteins that are involved in the main function of mitochondria, which is ATP production. Um, we're not going to go into any of the details of the biochemistry of that but mitochondria are the main source of ATP in eukaryotic cells. So you can probably guess anything that reduces the amount of ATP production in a mitochondrion by mutation is going to negatively impact the amount of ATP that they can produce and the amount of energy available to the cell and to the organism. Now, mitochondria are derived from bacteria and became symbiotic with a primitive eukaryotic cell. And this is what the mitochondrial uh, genome looks like. It resembles a bacterial genome. It's circular. It's very compact. And uh, there's not a lot of space. So you can see almost the entire genome is made up of genes. These genes are two main types. They encode proteins, so these are the mostly the yellow uh, and green colored segments here. And those proteins are involved in the process of ATP production. Or the other type are genes that are encoding RNAs, and uh, those RNAs are involved in uh, translation in mitochondria. So ribosomal RNAs and also tRNAs. Okay, basic structure of the mitochondrial genome. How about chloroplasts? Well, chloroplasts are an organelle with three membranes. The innermost membrane is highly folded and organized into these stacks, basically disc-like stacks. Those are called the thylakoid membrane. And that's the location where the main function in chloroplasts take place. And that function is in this membrane are uh, molecules called chlorophyll and other proteins associated with chlorophyll. They're involved in absorbing light energy. And then the chloroplast is able to use that light energy to uh, make carbohydrates such as glucose. Okay. Here is the chloroplast genome, and this is kind of a general chloroplast genome. Um, and uh, the details vary between different plant species. But in general, what you find in the chloroplast genome is very similar to the mitochondrion. There are various proteins that are encoded, shown here in the green box and color-coded green on this map. So those are proteins involved in the, the processes of ATP production different stages of that. There are also uh, proteins and RNAs involved in translation. So ribosomal proteins, um, tRNAs, 
ribosomal RNAs, and various transcript translation factors. Um, the chloroplast genome is a little bit less compact and a little bit larger than the mitochondrial genome, but it's, um, you know, not huge. On average, 120 to 160 kilobases long. Now, for both mitochondria and chloroplasts, the organelles contain more than one genome and cells contain more than one organelle. In some cases, hundreds of each organelle. Now, uh, one thing about uh, the functions of both mitochondria and chloroplasts, they make their own proteins that are encoded in their own genes, and those proteins are involved in the function. So mitochondria, ATP production, chloroplast, um, absorbing light energy and generating carbohydrate, synthesizing carbohydrates. Uh, but uh, they need help. So not all of the proteins involved in those processes are encoded in the organelle genome. They have to import proteins that are encoded in the nucleus of the cell to, uh, in order to carry out the complete function. One example of that is in mitochondria. There's an enzyme called cytochrome oxidase C. This enzyme has seven protein subunits, three of which are encoded by mitochondrial genes and four by nuclear genes. These four subunits are uh, made in the cytoplasm and the proteins are imported into the mitochondria. Now, just a word about mutations in genes in mitochondria and in chloroplasts. Mutations in uh, mitochondrial genes, usually mutations are uh, loss of function, so either partial, hypomorphic, or complete, null. And a loss of function is going to slow down at best or completely stop ATP production in mitochondria. Um, so that's going to affect energy availability to the cell or to the organism. Mutations in chloroplast genes are involved in either synthesis of the pigment chlorophyll or in the process of harvesting light energy to make carbohydrates. When a chloroplast makes a carbohydrate in a plant cell, that carbohydrate is used by the mitochondria to generate ATP. So a similar phenotype can result from mutations in chloroplast genes, a lack of sufficient energy. In addition, if the mutation is involved in uh, creates a defect in creating uh, chlorophyll, then that might affect the, the color of the cells. Plant cells having chlorophyll, which is a green pigmented molecule, appear green. And um, if the mutation affects chlorophyll production, then those cells will not be green, they'll appear white. So that's another phenotypic expression of mut uh, mutations in chlorophyll chloroplast genes. And that can be seen on uh, plants that show what's called a variegated phenotype. Variegation involves patches of um, plant um, structures such as leaves. Some of them are green. They have chloroplasts that are making chlorophyll. Some of them are white and those contain cells with chloroplasts that can't make chlorophyll. Now, cells that can't make chlorophyll are not going to be able to make their own carbohydrates and not going to be able to produce their own energy. However, if they're part of a plant uh, that has green patches, they're relying on those cells to provide them with um, carbohydrates in order to make ATP. So this is this slide is showing one example in four o'clock plants, which uh, typically have a variegated phenotype. Okay. Now, uh, one thing about um, organelle genes. 
they are inherited typically only from the mother. So they exhibit what's called maternal inheritance. Why is that? The reason is that uh, during the production of gametes, females, this is true in plants and also in animals, females produce, produce an ovum, which is relatively large. It has a nucleus, haploid nucleus, and it has a lot of cytoplasm. And because it has a lot of cytoplasm, it has a lot of organelles. Male gametes, sperm or pollen, basically is a nuclear de delivery device. It has a nucleus, haploid nucleus, enclosed in a membrane or some other capsule for pollen grains, for example, but not a lot of cytoplasm and not a lot, if any, organelles. And so typically, when fertilization occurs, the zygote receives nuclei from both parents, equal contribution, but it receives cytoplasm and organelles only from the female. So if there's a mutation in a gene in a chloroplast or a mitochondrion, then that will be passed through the female uh, line, not through the male gametes. There are also other mechanisms that are involved in this. I'm not going to go in detail about this, but uh, they're listed at the bottom of this slide. All right, here's a demonstration of maternal inheritance. This was the first demonstration, and this was demonstrated in a bread mold called Neurospora. This experiment was done in 1952 by a husband and wife team, Mary and Herschel Mitchell. They grew Neurospora, and it grows as basically these tubes of haploid cells and uh, they found that um, their Neurospora strain generated uh, usually grew very quickly if they put some bread in and seeded it with some mold it would grow uh, pretty extensively within a day or two however they found another strain in which the growth was significantly slower it would take a week or more in order for the mold to um, grow on when after being seeded. So they call this strain the pokey strain. And uh, they did the following experiment, which was you can, uh, Neurospora ha has male and female um, genders. The female gender will create a, the, the equivalent of an egg, a relatively large gamete with lots of cytoplasm. The male gender will create uh, the equivalent of a sperm, a small gamete with not much cytoplasm. All right, so knowing that, they set up basically reciprocal crosses in Neurospora and cross A here, they crossed a pokey female strain and that generated an egg and that was crossed with a normal or a wild type male strain generating a sperm. When they did that, they formed a zygote, diploid zygote. And in Neurospora, this is a very brief diploid stage. This cell, the zygote, undergoes immediate meiosis uh, to form four cells, and then one mitosis to form eight cells. And all of those are packed in a spore pod. And that's what we have here, eight cells, resulting from a meiosis and then one round of mitosis. When they did this, crossing a female pokey strain to a male wild type strain, they found that all of the spores produced were pokey. All the offspring here resembled the maternal strain. When they did the reciprocal cross, a wild type female strain, fast growing female, Cross to a pokey male strain, they formed the diploid zygote, which went on, underwent one round of meiosis, forming four cells, and then one round of mitosis, forming eight cells, which are packed in this um, spore pod. When they grew all of these on bread, they found that they all grew at the rapid rate. These were the wild type. Right, so they resembled the maternal strain. Okay, so 
in, in these experiments, they also included a, a gene encoded on uh, nuclear chromosomes just as a control to make sure Neurospora did not display some weird form of non-Mendelian inheritance. When they did that, the diploid would have a wild type copy and a mutant copy, and that would be distributed 50-50. Okay, so Mendelian inheritance was indeed happening in Neurospora, but for the pokey phenotype, this was being distributed only through maternal inheritance, all offspring showing the maternal phenotype in both crosses. All right, so this is the typical way that organelle genes and mutants are passed uh, from generation to generation through maternal inheritance. And we'll see examples of that later when we talk about uh, human uh, diseases caused by mitochondria. I wanna go back to chloroplasts um, and describe uh, some experiments that were done in four o'clock plants, remember they're variegated. Um, and just a lead in before we get to the experiment, a variegated four o'clock plant can have structures like this. Here's a stem that's completely green, meaning all cells on this stem have wild type chloroplast producing chlorophyll. That would be true for the flowers as well, having wild type cells producing chlorophyll. And that would be true for the gametes coming from these flowers, um, ovules and um, pollen grains. Here's a different stem, all white, meaning all of the cells have mutant chloroplasts, unable to produce chlorophyll. That would be true for the flowers as well. Um, they're mutant, they will produce mutant ovules and mutant pollen grains. Um, finally, on this stem, it's variegated. So there are some cells that have wild type chloroplasts and some that have mutant. And that would be true for the flowers as well and for the gametes that produce, they produce. Some of them will be wild type, some will be mutant, okay? If you look at the uh, actual cells involved here, the cells can be um, a, two main types, what are called heteroplasmic cells, in heteroplasmic cells, remember cells contain multiple chloroplasts. Um, you can have a mixture of some chloroplasts containing wild type uh, genotype and able to produce chlorophyll. So they're indicated by green on this slide. And other chloroplasts that are mutant and un unable to produce chlorophyll. In a cell that uh, has a mixture, it's called a heteroplasmic cell. A heteroplasmic cell, as long as it has, it has some wild type chloroplast, is able to produce chlorophyll and it would appear green. Now, during mitosis, the chloroplasts are sort of randomly divvied up to daughter cells. So sometimes that will be equal in our heteroplasmic cell. Daughter cells might get equal amounts of mutant and wild type, but sometimes it could be something like this, an unequal distribution. One cell gets mostly wild type, the other one gets mostly mutant. And um, here's a subsequent division in which one cell gets all of the wild type chloroplasts and this one gets none of them. So this would generate what's called a homoplasmic cell. And that can be true for wild type um, chloroplasts as well. They can be unequally distributed. You can end up with a homoplasmic cell for wild type. Chloroplasts. Uh, a cell that's homoplasmic will only generate daughter cells that are also homoplasmic for the type that they are. So this one being mutant uh, will produce only daughter cells that are also mutant. And this will generate uh, a white patch in a variegated plant. All of these have some wild type chloroplasts. And as long as their daughter cells still get some wild type chloroplasts, they would produce cells that appear green because of the chlorophyll being produced. Okay, so to summarize, homoplasmic cells, when they undergo meiosis, also produce homoplasmic daughter cells. 
heteroplasmic cells, when they undergo meiosis, they can produce either heteroplasmic daughter cells, homoplasmic wild type cells, or homoplasmic mutant cells. Okay, so let's take a look at an experiment in which um, a guy named Carl Korins did the following types of crosses in four o'clock plants. So just to go back, he did this cross. He took pollen from either green stem uh, flowers or white stem flowers or variegated stem flowers. And he pollinated ovules on all three possible types, green, white, or variegated, okay? So if he did this, he pollinated ovules on green stems with pollen from green, white, or variegated. All of the offspring that grew were green plants. So that is maternal inheritance, right? Crossing a green ovule derived um, ovule from a green plant to a pollen from a white plant produces green, maternal inheritance, okay? Same thing here, if he pollinated uh, ovules on white stems with pollen from green, white, or variegated stems, he would always see the phenotype of the, um, the, the maternal um, donor of the ovule, right? Maternal inheritance. When he did this though, um, the result was slightly different. So pollinating ovules on a variegated stem with pollen from green, white, or variegated, produce plants that could be any of the three types, green, white, or variegated. What's the explanation for that? Shown on this slide. Let's look at the light or right two panels first. So on a white branch, all of the eggs that are produced are homoplasmic for the mutant chloroplasts. And since uh, fertilization uh, results in zygotes containing only the maternal organelles, all offspring would be white. Here um, on a green branch, all eggs produced would have wild type chlor uh, chloroplasts. And um, all fertilizations, regardless of where the pollen is coming from, would produce plants with green stems. On a variegated branch though, some of the eggs will be homoplasmic wild type, some will be homoplasmic uh, mutant, and some will be heteroplasmic. So the pollen uh, fertilization will produce, um, in this case, green plants, in this case, white plants, in this case, variegated plants. So it is actually uh, supporting the idea of maternal inheritance, but this uh, variegated branch is producing eggs of three different types. So that was the main conclusion of Corinth and the experiment that he carried out. So I'll end this video here. In the next video, I'll talk about mitochondrial diseases.